Do you know what my like favorite thing about Easter is? Gav, was I telling you this? <laughs> I love Jesus. You on were, Twitter yes. Uh, and we have disagreements <laughs> about which account you should be following, but there's multiple Jesus accounts. And no, I have to read funny. you the tweet. Painter needed for this Thursday night. Picture of me and the lads. <laughs> Cash in hand. <laughs> it is I don't work like it for, for I'm meeting a few lads. I need a table for this thing. It's our first supper. Um, so yeah, yeah. Oh, like so if you're not following Jesus imagine, on, like, twi on Twitter at Easter, like what are you doing? <laughs> like imagine rigging up a restaurant though and saying, like, like, "Can I have a table for 13 And then going, "13? Really? That's an odd number, literally." <laughs> and then you go, "Oh yeah." And we also we all need to be sat on the same side of the table because there's going to be somebody doing a portrait <laughs> over the other side, and need to be able to see all of us face on. Just such an unorthodox booking. But then again, Thursdays are quiet nights, so what are you going to do? Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> Hello, you're very welcome along to episode four of the group chat. I am news correspondent at Virgin Media News, Richard Chambers. I'm joined by my fellow news correspondent in studio, Zara King. Hello, how are you? And from a remote location, which is undisclosed, political <laughs> correspondent Gavin Riley. Yay! I should disclose the location. Uh, I'm not in some sort of uh, foreign glamorous assignment like you were, Richard, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I am in the Trim Castle Hotel because uh, it's my cousin Anya's wedding uh, right now. So I've just taken a little uh, little break out to come and say hello to you guys, uh, which is why you're seeing me in a tie because I know that ordinarily we try to to break the usual dress code for this, but I'm, I'm in a tie for for the big day. Uh, so uh, happy wedding day to Anya and Nick. I hope you have a wonderful time. And also thank you to the staff at Trim Castle Hotel who have found a nice quiet place for me to sit down and do this uh, in the middle of everything else going. On. Gab, I'm all about those glasses, by the way. They're very trendy. Yeah, very, yeah. Yeah, yeah we were just saying all fair that, like, uh, when you're going to a wedding and you already wear a suit on television every day anyway, that you have to kind of do something to make it look like you're you're not just dressed as if you're about to walk in front of a camera. So that's partly the glasses because I don't usually wear them on, on screen, but also it's why you get this uh, this fetching paisley uh, sort of turquoisey tie, uh, which I would never otherwise uh, wear on camera. But there you go. It's my, my special tie <laughs> just for you guys uh, and obviously for the bride and groom as well. OK, so we're jumping straight into it now. Yeah. Obviously, there was huge news which broke earlier on this week, and that was the announcement both by officials and authorities here in Ireland, officials and authorities in the United Kingdom, but most notably the US Department of the Treasury, as well as the DEA uh, and the Department of Homeland Security, that the Kinnahans, the leaders of the Kinnahan crime cartel, are wanted men. Five million dollar bounty has been slapped on each of them for information that would bring them to justice. Sanctions have been imposed on them, much like they were against our friends, the Russian oligarchs uh, and other regimes uh, which are contrary to the um, stated uh, objectives of the United States. But this is a huge move. I mean, you were at this press conference. Now, I want to tell everyone, you texted the group and you were like, I've never been at a swankier press conference than this. This is unbelievable. I, I, want, to, I want to set the scene at this. You said it like, had sheen. There was, was absolute sheen at this press conference because it wasn't a pokey sort of thing where there was a PowerPoint presentation. This was in City Hall, which is very rarely used. Yep. Amazing rotunda there, the big columns. You had all of these. I didn't realise there was no detail what was actually going to be happening in this thing. Yep. Word had leaked overnight about the imposition of these sanctions. There was nothing about a wanted poster or anything like that. We all turned up as journalists and we were waiting outside and we saw all these very sharp suited Americans and they had all these badges, you know, those little golden badges for like the DEA and stuff like that. And we're like, whoa, this is a big deal. <laughs> um, like the US ambassador was there, the Irish ambassador to the US was there and it's like, okay, this is something interesting. But what was most noteworthy to me was it was one of the few occasions that you go into a press conference and you are genuinely surprised by what happens next. And that was when the US ambassador, Claire Cronin, turned around to a screen like the one behind us here towards Gavin. And she said, that is why the United States is today imposing a $5 million reward for information to Kenans. And it was just like wow. one of those, holy, holy crap, this is a big, big, big moment. Was there a prompt for all of this, Richard? Because it's the one thing that seems slightly surprising for those of us from the outside who sort of weren't following the nitty gritty of the, the process behind this, that it doesn't seem from the outside that there was any actual sort of a trigger for this. It wasn't that somebody involved in the Kinahan group did something specific mm. to say, right, this is the, the line at which you've crossed now. So kind of what was behind the timing of it all? Did they give any sense of that yesterday? A couple of things, and we'll get into this now with our guests in, the, in a couple of minutes as well. But there was a couple <laughs> of things which the guards, and I asked about this, because people rightly would ask, well, why are the US getting involved in this? Well, this is a multi, multinational crime organisation. This is like the Google of crime in terms of the scale of it around the world. It has tentacles on all continents. It has huge connections 
uh, right around the world. And you're also seeing the Kinahan stepping, of course, into the sporting world as well, which is another massive industry. So that raises the, 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 the alarm bells in the United States about this. But also the fact of the matter is... And they're involved in quite high profile, with quite high profile people, yes, of course. Yes, Tyson Fury, of yeah. course, is somebody who is, would, would count, says that Daniel Kinahan is a friend and an advisor to him, Tyson Fury, uh, world heavyweight champion, effectively. Mm -hmm. But the guards had been working on this very silently for many, many years. They'd done many trips over to Washington, basically saying, hey, you guys need to take this seriously. And the Brits were doing the same thing as well. The NCA, the National Crime Agency, very line of duty. They were very much powering away behind the scenes to push this. And it all culminated with that press announcement there earlier this week, which is a landmark moment. This country has had a big problem with gangland crime, particularly in the city of Dublin, uh, with the Kinahan crime cartel. This day, which happened earlier this week, has changed all of that forever. And it is something that, like I spent some time in the north inner city then after this announcement, and you know, to meet people in those communities who've been ravaged by drugs, that global action, they're really hoping it's going to have a local impact in terms of, you know, it's not going to rid the streets of drugs in the north inner city, but it is going to perhaps starve one of the biggest crime gangs whose work has effectively ruined many, many lives. What's remarkable about that, actually, Richard, just when you say that the uh, the guards have been over and back to Washington a couple of times, it's only literally just as you say it that I remember when I was there with the Taoiseach uh, a little under a month ago, I actually remember somebody telling me that uh, as part of Ireland's more recent, you know, this global global Ireland program, this this whole idea of expanding Ireland's diplomatic footprint, that they've actually gone out of their way. I think for the first time there's been a full-time guard posted in Washington, not for any specific crime on the beat stuff, but rather as this kind of a diplomatic outreach. And maybe actually then what you've seen, therefore, is, is the, the that bearing some fruit, that you have somebody who's been out there trying to build up a relationship with American law enforcement and sort of convincing them that there are some merits to coming over to Ireland with one of these bold gestures to try and, uh, and clamp down the whole thing, which is fascinating. Um, so you mentioned the, the thing at uh, City Hall yesterday, or rather yesterday at the time that we're recording this on Tuesday morning. Uh, one person who wasn't there is a guy who had actually broken the story a bit before everyone else. That is Mick O'Toole, who is the crime and security correspondent with the Irish Daily Star. He was excluded uh, from that press conference for reasons which we probably imagine he explained uh, when he spoke to both of you a short time ago. Well, for more on this now, we're joined by Mick O'Toole. He is the crime and defence correspondent with the Irish Daily Star. Mick, you have been covering the Kinahans and the cartel for many, many, many years now. Could you just tell us a little bit of background about them? Why is it now, really, as well, that the US has decided to get involved in such a huge way? It's a very good question. I, I first covered the Kinahans in early 2002 when Daniel Kinnan was charged with a number of others with assaulting I think it was two off-duty guardia at Shelburne Park in Dublin. And he was put into custody and we got a, a picture of him being driven away. And really at that stage, he was just an ordinary fella charged with, a, with an offence. I think we probably knew there was something bigger to him at, this, at, at that stage, probably why I was, I was down there with the photographer. But really, 2007, 2008, even 2005, he just started to explode. The whole Kinahan cartel just started to explode. I was looking at the the stories that I've done on the Kinahans since 2002, and I think I've done over a thousand. And then on the 5th of February 2016, the Kinahan, the Hutches hit back and they tried to kill Daniel Killen again at the famous Regency Airport Hotel shooting. They missed Kinahan by seconds. But again, his security detail reacted. One of them threw a bottle uh, of water at one of the gunmen managed to get Kinnan out. Um, several people escaped. One of them was David Byrne, a man who had been a close associate in the drug street of Daniel Kinnan. But uh, David Byrne managed to escape, but he ran back into the hotel. And Dave, uh, you know all about the fake ERU men. One of them saw David Byrne, one of their top targets, and they shot him dead. <clears throat> that was a massive, uh, really massive crime. But what came afterwards was even bigger. Yeah, and Mick, I remember being at the Regency Hotel that night uh, of that shooting. Uh, you were obviously there. Do you, at that time, did you realise that this was the beginning of something quite serious, or had you any idea at that point what was what was out or what was about to come? Uh, yes and no. I remember I went on radio on the Monday, so that happened on the on the on the, fr on the Friday. On the Monday, I went on uh, the Shallow Work Show, and I said, "Look, this kind of gang are absolutely massive, and there will be absolute hell to pay for this." So that was at about half ten. At half eight that night, a man called Eddie Hutch was shot dead. He would be Jerry Hutch's brother. He was a 58-year-old man. He was walking into his house. Had no involvement in the crime. Picked off because he was a member of the Hutch family. And that really was the start of a tsunami of not only murders, but attempted murders. For, for about a year, from February 2016 to February 2017, 
it was mayhem in Dublin. I mean, if, I mean, my our, our office is just that, off Talbot yeah. Street there. And, you know, you can remember seeing the ERU, the Emergency Response Unit, the Armed Support Unit, Special Detective Unit, all going around with, with you know, MP7 machine pistols and Hector and Cock 416 assault rifles. It, obviously, I'm from Belfast. I grew up with the troubles, seeing soldiers in the streets, and it, it, it was deeply troubling for me. I know the guards had to do it, and they, they were mounting life-saving operations, but I just... It was, you know, I, I just didn't like seeing armed guardy so heavily. They had to, but it was just, it was a, a consequence of the real cataclysmic events that were happening in Irish gangland. For It was really, really bad for a year. And look, as journalists, I'm sure you were up to your tonsils with it. It didn't stop for me. It was just one day after the other, after the other. And it was just, just it was unending. I mean, there was a shooting every week that year, wasn't there? It was. I mean, it was really... Even living, I was living in, in yeah. city centre at the mm. time. And it just even that brings me back, Mick, even those those checkpoints with the ERU and the <coughs> machine guns and, yeah. you know, body armour and masked up guards. It was really just an intense time in the city. But I want to ask, there is a, f a view now, and you, you're hearing this confidence expressed by Gardaí that the days of the Kinahan cartel are numbered. Are you as confident as the authorities would be that that era is coming to an end? I, I would actually, yeah. Um, I, 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 we did a story in Monday's paper. We, we got a bit of a sniff about what was going to happen on Tuesday. We knew that there might be, you know, some economic sanctions against Daniel Kinnan and we knew that he was going to be put on a new fly list but I was absolutely gobsmacked by the scale of the press conference by the scale of the sanctions that were announced you know seven people in businesses but also you know they went after Christy Kinnan the father Christy Jr Daniel who would be the say Christopher Kinnan senior would be the, chief, the chairman of the the cartel Daniel Kinnan is the chief executive he runs the show but it's just you know f five million dollars rewards when I saw uh, Miss Cronin, the U.S. ambassador uh, to Ireland, speaking at the press conference and announcing this this reward, I, I, I knew that this was a game changer because you know the, Ireland is a relatively small country. We do have soft power. We you know we project ourselves very well, but America is you know is a totally different ball game. So just looking at it, I was I just thought right, and you know this is this is a game changer. There's no mess in here. The Americans in, are involved, and Daniel Kinnan particularly has a very, very serious problem at the minute, and I'll explain why. We know that he's in Dubai. He left uh, Spain at the middle of the feud around 2017, partly because he was worried about being, about being arrested by the Guardi or the Spanish police, who the Spanish police said in, in court that he was, uh, or he orchestrated the murder of Gary Hutch in 2015. So they have evidence, Guardi have evidence they want to put to him. But he also left Europe because he was afraid of the members of the Hodge gang going after him. So there were two reasons. And he's now in, in, in effectively in an open-air prison in Dubai. There's no extradition there. He probably feels safe. You know, we can Ireland can battle and try and persuade the Dubai authorities. But when the Americans, who are the literal big guns, get involved, it just changes everything. So for me, there's an inevitability about it. Now, I was writing this in the Star today. It's $5 million dollars. That there is no loyalty in gangland, so we were to, our sources were telling us that they fully expect people who are close in his circle and his extended and Daniel Kinnan's extended circle really to rat him out because it's it's an awful lot of money yeah. and he is now a prime target. That's an incredible insight, Mick. Listen, before we let you go, because we're just nearly out of time, I want to ask you, you mentioned the press conference there. You had to watch that remotely, I believe, uh, on the podcast. We'd like, we like to give uh, <laughs> a bit of behind the scenes on what it's like to be a journalist working in the field. What exactly happened there? Uh, everybody thinks that, uh, probably you guys as well, that crime reporters have this marvellous, wonderful relationship with Guardi headquarters that we go up to the no Guardi headquarters. <laughs> well, yeah, I, used to, I know it's, look, I know it's said, but I think people think we go up to Guardi headquarters every day, they they give us our daily story and they pat us in the head and say, off oh, you go like a good boy. <laughs> we have uh, a, ve a very, you know, look, the professional people, they're doing their best. Uh, we have rows with, with people in the press office and, you know, representative of the guards all the time because, we, you know, we want to write things and they would rather we didn't write things. And, you know, but essentially what happened was we were, uh, I don't know how many people, but was, I mean, I, I certainly got a call, I think maybe a, a couple of, maybe five or six crime correspondents got a call over the weekend to say, look, or it was a, there was an excellent email saying, look, there's a press conference on Tuesday. It's strictly embargoed. Didn't say anything about it, what it was. It was, yeah. it was. I think it was basically a new wave of trans, uh, cooperation against transnational crime. But it didn't say we are going to get Daniel Kennan and all his cronies. So I looked at that and I went, what's this all about? 
I would be missing my job if I merely accepted that and decided not to dig. So, of course, I and others started digging and we found out what we can. Somebody once told me that journalists are lucky to hear 10% of what the truth is. And I, I, I would always agree with that. We have to dig. We have to go against it. I found yeah. out what was happening. Um, we took a decision. My editor, Neil Leslie, and I took a decision that... Uh, Embargoes are very important in journalism because you know it's, there's a level of trust. So I, we've all been there. We've all been told, right? Tomorrow at seven o'clock, the Taoiseach is launching this new policy, and it's going to be X, Y, and Z. That's embargoed, right? And that's full of detail. And you go, okay, we'll ex we'll respect that embargo, and we'll do it when they want it to come out. But there was nothing in the embargo. It was just merely we we were embargoing a press conference. So I didn't think that this was embargoed. Uh, I did the story. My colleague, my frenemy, Stephen Breen, the son, they took a, a similar view. I th One of the reasons why I was so adamant about doing the story was I knew and suspected that other newspapers you were going to be doing a story yeah. Sunday for and Monday. And I, no, I didn't want to get yeah. spooked, scooped. And, you know, I, I had good, solid info. And people are very interested in Kenan. So we spliced on it. And the, the reaction was... Uh, somewhat uh, strong, um, <laughs> and we were basically we were basically told. What did they say to you, Mick? Did they tell you off? Did you get a slap uh, well, on the wrist? I, <laughs> we, I have, like many crime, like all crime journalists, I have a professional relationship with the Guard Press Office, and that involves rights. Okay, it's not as if we're the booze and buddies. We are frequently in conflict, and I'm glad this this has come out because. You know, people do really do have to realise that you know it's it's a bit uh, how can I say it's it's a bit really strong sometimes, and there is significant conflict. Now, I was very disappointed. I was told I wasn't welcome at the press conference. So my colleague, eventually, my colleague Laura Colgan went and she did a fantastic job, and there was no problem. So the star was there. I personally felt very affronted because I've had lots of rows with mm. loads of press officers, uh, lots of guards. I, I can remember once. Uh, not a press officer, but somebody in Garda headquarters contacted someone, in, now this is years ago, someone in the press office because I had a story and they said, what is, why did you let him write that? They sort of think that, you know, the press office can control what we write or they want to control what we write. Well, they, sometimes they try, but, you know, so we have a, a, a good and sometimes fractious relationship with the, pre the press department. I would imagine that any other journalist would have it with any political party or the army press office, or, I mean, I've had rows with the army press office. I do defense as well. So, you know, I do lots of stories that they do not like. And I do lots of stories that the Garda press office don't like. They usually accept it because, you know, they're professional. Just, I think to be fair to them, they were very annoyed because they, their argument would be, look, you didn't get this in, you wouldn't have got this information without us signaling that there was something happening on, on mm. Tuesday. I don't know, because I've had stories break. I've had been told things at two minutes to midnight, and we, I literally have said, hold the front page to my to, to the news, to, to the editor. It just happens. Maybe the, maybe they were right. Maybe I wouldn't have heard. I like to, I would like to think that we all have sources and we get and things start to percolate out. I knew that there were Americans here last week, for example, and I was just trying to you know, put, put two and two together. Sometimes we have to put two and two together, and mm. you get four. Sometimes you get four and a half. But anyway, here's the hunt. They, they said that I wasn't uh, welcome at it. I was very, very annoyed about that because it's never happened to me before and I've never broken an embargo before. Embargoes are very important for me. For me, there was nothing to embargo. But look, you know, uh, I have been in contact with uh, the, the Garda Press Office since and uh, sure we're grand. <laughs> they've they've <laughs> all made well, you. Well. You know. Uh, well, I mean, Nick, look, you know, as speak? I say, I, I, I do regret one thing. I, I, I went on a bit of a Twitter rant and... I, I have to say, you know, it was a stream of consciousness. I was really, really annoyed. So I was on this, I was at the Monday, Monday night. I was told you're not going tomorrow. And I was really, really annoyed and it was steaming overnight. It was really, really furious. And I was watching it and I just decided to go on this big Twitter rant. And I, I, I used the word, I, I used, I, I used an intemperate word. It wasn't the worst uh, insult, but it was something that I regretted. Sort of, you know, it, it poked them fun on. at them maybe a wee bit and I shouldn't do it. It was a hit of them one thing and I, I deleted that too and I do regret that. Look, they are very professional. They are supposed to, I always tell this, people think the Garda Press Office work for journalists. They don't, they work for Drew Harris. So of course there's going to be conflict. But look, I get on with the, the press office personally and professionally. I think it's good to have the odd row occasionally. Oh, Damn right. like we have rows yeah. every week with lots of press offices, and that's part of your job is to, you know, battle it out exactly. to get to the information for people. You mean, that's what we get paid to do. So, yeah, I think we can all speak for. I'll tell, tell you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one other thing. I, 
years ago, I mean, this is just the, the I'll just give you an example. I, I did a story that the Garda headquarters went baloob is about. And somebody, I won't say who it was, it wasn't a press officer, but it was somebody rang my, my news editor. This was this was 20 years ago and said, that Mick O'Toole fella, he's a sly, slimy, sleevy, nordy beep. So, you know, that's what happens. But it was Grant, you were all good over it. <laughs> you leave these things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> these, are, these are all bumps in the road to an eventual destination, which it's, is the truth. So there know, you go, Mick. Look, I get on with the press office. There's no problem. I personally think it's a good thing that we all have, you know, rise with each other and yeah. they have their point of view, we have ours. It's part of the function in democracy. Well, listen, thank you for giving us a little bit of a look behind the curtain, Mick. We do really appreciate it. And for giving us that no problem on, on the Kinahans. Much appreciated. Mick O'Toole there of the Irish Daily Star. Fascinating insight into the Kinahans. We are going to be watching very closely what happens with them uh, as we go. Obviously mm. covering crime, somebody he has a huge experience of there. Yes. Do you have any particular stories from covering uh, crimes? I mean, are? look, obviously we're not crime correspondents, but we <laughs> do get sent to crime scenes uh, a lot in our career. I suppose a couple of different memories from, from my time on the crime beat, particularly as a younger journalist. I uh, remember one very senior crime lord who will remain nameless was shot one time and I was sent out to the scene of the crime on a Sunday morning and uh, trying to be kind of low-key and not, not be noticed. And uh, that person's brother knocked on the window of my car and basically wow. proceeded to yell at me and ask me, how do you sleep at night? You journalists are the scum of the earth. And I thought, well, I suppose being called the scum of the earth by a crime lord's brother is <laughs> certainly, you know, a complimentary <laughs> Sunday morning at work. But um, I mean, that's kind of standard, I think, really. I mean, I'm sure Mick O'Toole has probably got far more Motorist. interesting stories. I know he had one story about you that we didn't get to during the interview, but he had met you at a, was it a particular crime? Yes, there was, um, it was a funeral for one of the members, one of the members of the, of the Hutch family. And this is just, a, it was, I was very green as a journalist at the time. Now he tells the story quite differently, but basically it was on Sean McDermott Street in North Inner City was where the funeral was. <laughs> on. Uh, I was sent down to cover it. We were told it would be a, a, a ring of steel is what the, the terminology is, that the Guardi would have a huge presence there to make sure that nothing went wrong at this. Uh, walked down through it, there was no visible Garda presence. There were like unmarked squad cars going past, all that sort of stuff. But all of us journalists kept on walking and are, are driving down just to try and get to a sort of a distance, a, a respectable distance. So a couple of us sort of huddled up at the end of the road and we were just there and we were sort of saying, well, what do we do here? This is a very difficult thing to actually cover because you do have to cover it. This is an important uh, event in the North Inner City at a time when there is a, a turf war effectively in, in Dublin. And there's also that balance, I think, as well, between it being a family grieving as well. Yeah, exactly. And you, you have know? to be respectful. Yeah. This is and it's same. someone's child, you know, at the end exactly. of the day. Exactly. You have yeah. to be respectful. That. That's why distance is important. Mm. Uh, dignity and respect is also important for these things. So we were all just, a few of us were, were, were down a good distance away uh, from where the funeral was. And I remember the car pulled up that Mick O'Toole, Mick O'Toole himself was in. And I remember he got out of the car and he started looking down towards us. And I was like, I reckon that's Mick O'Toole, that is. <laughs> and I sort of, after a while of sort of that sort of thing where you're just staring at somebody who's staring back at you and you're like, I wonder if he's looking at me. And I sort of did the upwards head nod thing of recognition and he just immediately that, turned this around. This is not Mick's version of I know, the story, it by the yeah. way. Can I, like Mick, O'Toole, over and talked, yeah. Mick O'Toole, Gavin, said that Richard completely blew his cover <laughs> at this massive crime funeral. He this was trying to said. Yeah. incognito and Richard was roaring, hiya Mick. He didn't do that. Absolutely that's didn't his version of events. That's but he's, basically what happened Richard's was... Richard's a terror for just shouting out to people on the street <laughs> and just going, hell yeah, I'm yeah. Richard Chambers, just to completely blow any incognito there. Oh, was that it? But whatever, the eventual, the outcome of the story is exactly the same anyway in that he turned around and he just went off and away and I just saw a little text on my phone uh, like a minute or two later saying you don't know me from Mick O'Toole <laughs> like, uh, which is really that's really how you have to do it so Mick is an absolute pro at these things he's, he's a, a, a phenomenal guy I'm sure we'll get him back on the pod at some time because he has so many great stories I wonder are we really annoying to crime journalists and we turn up with scenes because we're just kind of sort of thrown in on, on given days and stuff and they're probably like probably will be like, yeah. this gang just rocking in here yeah they maybe. probably have an issue with, with, with day trippers just showing up and sort of covering the beat on a sort of a freelance basis when they're the guys who are showing up at this stuff uh, you know all day every day um, fair play to Mick as well not only for taking the call because it's very generous of him just to explain what went on and just for him to be uh you know, for him to, to give us some time and explain his, his insight into all of this as well. Uh, but also, Mick is a huge Manchester City fan. And at the time of recording, uh, Man City are playing in a Champions League quarterfinal. So it actually is quite a significant gesture of him uh, to give up 10 or 15 minutes. So that's, uh, that's pretty good of him. Oh, wow. uh, I have no crime stories because I've never been sent out onto the beat uh, for anything like that or to sent to a, a funeral or any other sort of a crime scene like that. The, the closest I've ever been is that my grandfather was John Gilligan's postman because he ah. did the postal rounds all around the meat of their border. So he was the I guy who delivered the post yeah, to yeah. Jessbrook at all the time. What an anecdote. 
I would say just for people, like, crime scenes are sort of like, they're interesting places, aren't they, in terms of, mm. you know, it can be very different, I think, you know, when you go to a crime scene, a particularly that kind of gangland crime, I think it can be, you know, a very, as you mentioned there, kind of particularly that year when there was like shootings happening quite frequently, that there was kind of almost a real like nervousness around a lot of those crime scenes because there was never any clarity as to when the next retaliation shooting would happen. And, and, and you didn't know who was sort of hanging around that scene, sort of mm. watching everything that was happening. You have to be so careful working very in that environment. So. Yeah. I remember the first one I was ever sent to, I was working in radio at the time. And uh, I was basically, I think I was, I was a very, very junior journalist. I was either freelancing or I was an intern at the time. And I basically went out in a taxi. Uh, and I went out to this housing estate where the, um, the, where the, the murder had taken place. Uh, and there was obviously the guard at Corden was around there. Uh, I just had my little school bag on, my laptop, and uh, just sort of started, sat, I sat on a curb. I didn't have like a, a car to retreat to for safety. I was sitting on the curb, just jabbing away on my, my laptop, sort of putting up some copy so I can send it back to base. And I just remember like there's people cycling by sort of saying, get out of here, you rat, and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, okay, that's when you learn that having a car as a journalist yeah. is a very, very important thing. Uh, like a similar sort of thing, also I sort of had that realisation, it wasn't really a crime scene, but it's with law enforcement. It's on the other end of things, when you cross those guys. And there was actually, it was when I was in the United States, and I was on the US-Mexico border in Texas. And you know the way that the border wall, yeah. the... the, the you uh, told me the story yeah. before. <laughs> and I, was, I had to get to a house which was between the United the States and Mexico. the dog that chased you. Yeah, yeah, it's between basically the fence and... Um, the border, which is the river, the Rio Grande River. Yeah. And I had to get to this house. And I pulled up in my little Fiesta rental car and I got <laughs> out of the car and like there was border patrol in these big Jeeps. And these guys have an awful reputation. That just shooting people. Yes, that there is like, um, that there is like, that, like they would obviously fight, fight back on that and say, look, we're defending our frontier. Yeah. But there's a fearsome reputation and they're driving around constantly on patrol. Um, and basically I got out to basically show I'm not a threat here. I was walking towards this house. And I just see this guy, the, the, the Border Patrol car starts creeping towards me. And I just get to the house, which is basically this ranch. I walk around the, the corner. And I think, OK, I'm safe here. These two giant, I don't know what type of dog they were. Bull Mastiffs, <laughs> Rottweilers, who knows? Like they, they, they must have taken on seismic gargantuan proportions in my mind since then. But they just came roaring at me, jumping up at me. I genuinely thought I was going to die. Wow. Um, and they were just like, they so didn't. Is that to say, Richard, that that the house is between the fence and the border. Yes. So the, the house is no man's in land. the United States, but on the wrong side of the fence. Yes, exactly. It's fascinating. It is a fascinating is story, mad. which we'll get into. I'm sure we'll go back to it, but basically it was one time when I thought I was going to die. The border patrol man pulls out and he basically says, yeah, man, those dogs, they're just there to scare you away. Did they some did lady take you into her house and mind you after that? We did, yeah, we did yeah, a great I interview, actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, good group chat <laughs> content there. Great little chat content. Ranch there. Okay, we need to move on, guys. Um, uh, the other thing, by the way, just, just uh, very briefly, just when people talk about the value of having a car as well, I remember literally the very first thing I was told when I moved into radio is that cars are brilliant for acoustics. So not only is it great for you to be able to get to and from a place and if you need to be able to get out very quickly it's also the place where you would record your voiceovers and sometimes when we are out and about as well and we need to record a voiceover to send back to be used in a package the acoustics in the car are always the best place for it because there's so much fabric that you get no echo Okay, I just want to fly through a couple of other stories this week before we finish. Um, one of the main stories this week, obviously the situation around the CMO and the abandoned secondment to uh, Trinity College. Tony Hewlin announcing last Saturday that he's not going to take up that secondment. It came after the Taoiseach, Micheál Martin, decided uh, to pause that pending a, a report or a briefing document, depending on who you speak to, uh, certainly Department of Health calling a briefing document from the Secretary General, Robert Watt. He gave that briefing document uh, to the Health Minister on Monday at the time of recording that was still being uh, considered by by, uh, the Taoiseach and the three leaders of the main parties. I suppose, look, the key thing here, uh, the takeaway from certainly all of the politicians has been lessons will be learned. Uh, which lessons is, uh, are being learned is basically the, learned. Is the mantra. Yeah, uh, which does... God knows what that actually means, Gavin. Uh, God knows, yeah, because uh, it, as, as our colleague Aoife Grace Moore said a couple of days ago, isn't it great that they set up a new department of higher education with all the lessons that they have to learn <laughs> uh, out of all of this? Uh, there's a couple of things that are, are that are just particularly striking. I know we need to, need to kind of uh, barrow through all of this. Um, firstly, the government did commit to publishing that report. It's now like 48 hours after it was handed over. Uh, hopefully it's been uh, published by the time people get to hear this, but no sign of it. Uh, B, 
Robert Watt was the author of the report, and by all accounts, Robert Watt has given Robert Watt a clean bill of health, which is worth noting. Um, he does say that he was not required to tell Stephen Donnelly about the nature of this uh, succumbent, and strictly speaking, he's not, because Stephen Donnelly is not responsible for HR stuff, but you'd think in hindsight that maybe given the significance of the role that it would have been better to bring him into the loop. Um, and D, everyone in government actually says, and this of course is pending the release of the report, everyone says that there's actually nothing to see because the comments are actually more routine than they say um, that you didn't have to bring it to the minister. They're also disputing this idea that Tony would be paid less than other professors because they say that if you compare it to other health professors, he'd actually be getting paid significantly less than they would. So they haven't broken the pay structure. And they all say actually that there is nothing to see here. But of course, we'll have to wait and see what the report actually says before we can know that for ourselves. Yeah, that chapter not closed as of yet. We're getting further information as well about the Ukrainian refugee situation with the accommodation. Basically, it's dawned on the government just how difficult it is going to be to house all of the people who we said we'd be able to house in this country. That is something we'll be returning to on the podcast as well. Emmanuel Macron, uh, Macron the French president, and uh, Marine Le Pen moving on to the final round of the French presidential election. That's more coming later on this month. Uh, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak uh, fined for Partygate as well. So... Um, that's always very uh, uh, an interesting one to, to see as well. Boris Johnson might benefit it's from the fact really that they're in recess at the moment. Yeah, which is uh, yeah, astonishing actually, timing on that for Boris that, Johnson. Sorry. I know that I'm slightly in delay, so I hope I'm not talking over you guys too much. Um, the, the, the convenience, first of all, that they're on recess, so there isn't this kind of sense of momentum around Westminster where you have to call them back. Uh, but also, it's worth bearing in mind that in the next coming days, you might well hear that Boris Johnson has been fined for participating at other gatherings as well, because the one that we know of thus far was basically just a meeting that was happening anyway, where somebody produced a birthday cake. As somebody said famously, he was ambushed by a birthday cake. They all sat around and sang happy birthday, and then they got on with their meeting. And if that is considered a party and a, a breach of the rules, then you can imagine as the Met wraps up its investigations into all the other stuff, it will say that all of them were also at rule breaking. And it could be interesting then if you have people who said that Boris Johnson deserved a clean bit of health after the first fine, will they still feel the same after a second or a third or a fourth for slightly more raucous gatherings, especially as we get to the other side of the Easter recess? All right, I just want to note there, and before we wrap up there today, obviously this has been a very difficult week for members of the LGBTI plus community. There mm -hmm. have been a number of high profile incidents. There, of course, was the assault on Evan Summers in Dublin City. Um, he says that Ireland has a long way to go with regards to hate crimes. He says more needs to be done to tackle this sort of violence. We also have, of course, the situation uh, in Sligo, Guardian investigating two uh, awful murders in Sligo, investigating whether or not hate crime is a motivation in that. We'll be closely monitoring that and what happens with this. But this is absolutely a very difficult week uh, for gay people in this country. We are going to be returning to this in quite some detail. The LGBT Ireland helpline can be reached on 1800 929 539. Mind yourself and thanks for listening.